continue to draw in those low pressure systems across our shores. So the city forecasts for the next four or five days into next week do show a lot of unsettled weather continuing. As ever, you can get more about the weather, including the warnings, on the website. Tonight at 10, the Home Secretary says the government is determined to stop what she calls an invasion of migrants. We need your help. Children cry for help at an overcrowded migration centre in Kent. Suella Bravman acknowledges the government has failed to control the number of migrants. We need to be straight with the public. The system is broken. Illegal. is out of control. How big does the crisis need to get, Home Secretary? And she is accused of potential breaches of security after sending six official government emails from her private account. With the Home Secretary under huge political pressure, we'll be asking whether she's done enough to ward off her critics. Also tonight... A special report from the front line of the fighting in Ukraine and the devastation it leaves behind. Look at it. Desolation. This is what months of attritional warfare does to a town. A political comeback in Brazil for the left-wing former president, who's won power by a narrow margin and how our unseasonably warm autumn may look beautiful, but is jeopardising ecosystems and confusing plants and animals. Coming up in sport on the BBC News Channel, Wales' Rugby League World Cup comes to an end after they're beaten by Papua New Guinea, who'll now play England in the quarterfinals. Good evening. The Home Secretary, Suella Bradman, has spoken of an invasion of migrants into England and says that the immigration system in the UK is broken and illegal migration is out of control. That's despite the Conservatives being in government for 12 years. She was speaking in the House of Commons as she faces growing pressure to resolve overcrowding at a migrant processing centre in Kent. The BBC has been told that Ms Bradman failed to agree measures which could have eased pressures there despite being warned that the government was acting outside the law. She insists that she would never ignore legal advice. The number of migrants arriving in the UK across the Channel is increasing. As you can see, in 2018, there are about 2,000 people arriving in small boats. Compare that to this year, almost 40,000. Part of the increase is down to the increasing number of Albanian men now making the crossing. The migrant processing centre on a disused airfield near Ramsgate is designed to process up to a thousand migrants who are only meant to spend a few hours there. There are currently thought to be about 4,000 migrants there, with some, including mothers with children, being there as long as five weeks. Our home editor, Mark Easton, has spent the day there. 
Freedom, freedom, they chant. The voices of children recorded by activists this weekend, among thousands housed at what's supposed to be a short-term migrant processing centre at Manston in Kent. They should be here for a few hours, a day or two at most, but some families have been detained for more than a month in conditions described by inspectors as wretched. There's currently an outbreak of scabies. There have been cases of diphtheria and MRSA. Most are now living in tents and sleeping on camping mats on the floor. So what's gone wrong? And should the crisis at Manston have been prevented? Home Office officials warned ministers last year that 60,000 migrants could cross the channel in small boats this year and the busiest months were likely to be October and November. At around the same time, the inspector of prisons told the government they needed to have plans for a surge in migrant numbers at places just like Manston. Yesterday, the Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick visited Manston and has been desperately trying to find alternative accommodation for those stuck there. But when a coach left this afternoon, it was largely empty. Some might have come here. The Humberview Hotel in North Therraby in East Yorkshire. It was on the Home Office's list to take asylum seekers. But local people have secured an interim High Court injunction, claiming the village is entirely unsuitable. In the Commons this afternoon, the Shadow Home Secretary said failures at Manston signalled that government decision-making has collapsed. There are very serious allegations now being reported that the Home Secretary was warned by officials and other ministers she was acting outside the law mm. by failing to provide alternative accommodation. On no occasion did I block hotels or veto advice to procure extra and emergency accommodation. Actually, the, the, the data and the facts are that on my watch since the 6th of September, over 30 new hotels were agreed. Yesterday saw almost a 1,000 migrants arrive. Today, none. The tide's not conducive despite calm weather. But more will be brought ashore beneath the white cliffs, and many people locally are exasperated. Welcome again to Shakespeare Beach. Eight days ago, two migrant boats pulled up onto a beach near Dover Harbour, the occupants disappearing into nearby woodland. A short time later, a desperate 16-year-old Albanian boy, one of 12,000 who've come from that country this year, ended up in Sue Doyle's living room until police eventually arrived. She's been left terrified. They're basically saying, oh, we've got to keep all the windows and doors shut, so next summer we've got to live in a prison. We've got to keep all our windows and doors locked which I don't think we should have to. The government hopes to deter asylum seekers by prosecuting arrivals and threatening to send some to Rwanda. But the courts may yet have a say on such measures and ministers must know there can be no quick fix to the UK's deepening asylum crisis. Mark Easton, BBC News, Dover. Well, as the Home Secretary was forced to defend the overcrowding at Manston in the Commons today, she also came under pressure from opposition MPs on another front. They accused her of a potential breach of security after she revealed today that she had sent official government information via her private email six times. She had to resign under Liz Truss for doing so just once and therefore breaching the ministerial code before she was reappointed a week later by Rishi Sunak. Here's our political editor, Chris Mason. Are you the right person to get this crisis under control, Home Secretary? Suella Braverman facing questions about what she hasn't done, has done and will do about those arriving in small boats. The Home Secretary. Yeah, yeah. In the Commons this evening, the Home Secretary was blunt, describing those arriving over the Channel using a word with wartime connotations. Invasion. The British people deserve to know which party is serious about stopping the invasion on our southern coast and which party is not. Let's stop pretending that they are all refugees in distress. The whole country knows that that is not true. And listen to this next bit, a candid assessment of government failure. We need to be straight with the public. The system is broken. Illegal Illegal migration is out of control. But the charge tonight from her critics, including on her own side, is since becoming Home Secretary just last month, she has made things worse at the Migrant Centre at Manston in Kent. 
That facility operated absolutely magnificently and very efficiently indeed until five weeks ago. When I'm afraid the Home Secretary took the policy decision not to commission further accommodation. And it is that that has led to the crisis at Manston. On no occasion have I blocked the procurement of hotels or alternative accommodation to ease the pressure on Manston. Consequently, Multiple sources have told the BBC, though, that officials warned the government was acting outside the law by failing to provide alternative accommodation. Mrs Braverman says she never ignored legal advice. The Home Secretary has also been trying to clear up today what she did and didn't do less than a fortnight ago when she found herself resigning from the very job she's now back doing again. She stood down because she twice broke the ministerial code. In a letter to MP, she said on the day she ended up out of a job, she'd been on a car journey to the Home Office. I only had my personal phone and email to hand. She used that phone and account to send a government document to a backbench MP and his secretary, but sent it to someone else in Parliament by accident. After that, she said, she went straight into back-to-back -back meetings with officials, but concluded within hours that I would inform my officials as soon as practicable. She also admitted that in her six weeks in the job, I had sent official documents from my government email to my personal email address on six occasions. The Prime Minister insists he has full confidence in his Home Secretary, who confronts ongoing questions about her own conduct while dealing with an issue those arriving on small boats loaded with moral, political and practical problems. And there is widespread acceptance that that problem is incredibly difficult to do things about and to try and resolve. And so what is striking about the Home Secretary's language tonight is she's setting the bar quite high for herself. She acknowledges that there has been ongoing government failure. And so if she survives long enough in post, will be judged as to whether or not she can improve the situation. So what about her short-term future? Well, she is defiant tonight. She was challenging her critics to say, try to get rid of me uh, in the Commons. She is insisting she is going nowhere. She is staying as Home Secretary. But the questions continue about her judgment. And privately, from senior levels in the Conservative Party all the way through the back benches, there are those who are questioning her judgment uh, and wondering whether she has the competence and grip in the job to be able to continue. Chris at Westminster, thank you. And if you want to follow more on that story, there are updates, news and analysis on BBC News Online. That's bbc.co.uk slash news. And of course, you can use the BBC News app as well. Now, we have a special report from Ukraine tonight, as Russia has again targeted Ukraine's energy infrastructure in a wave of missile strikes across the country, including the capital, Kyiv, where the mayor says four out of five people have been without running water. Ukraine says Russia fired at least 50 missiles, but it was able to shoot most of them down. Our international editor, Jeremy Byrne, has spent the last week travelling through Ukraine from the frontline battlefields of the Donbass in the east to the village of Myra Lyubivka in the Kherson region, an area where some of Russia's best troops are concentrated to try to stop a Ukrainian offensive. I should warn you, his report contains some deeply distressing details. For Ukrainians, this is a fight for national survival. The hardest test any nation can face. It upends every life. It has ended the lives of thousands. This is Bakhmut under heavy shelling. At the moment, the center of the artillery war in Donbass. Left is good. More than 70,000 people used to live here. Almost all of them have left. When I was last in Bakhmut in the summer, there was shelling, but it was still more or less functional. Some buses running, a few shops open. But now, look at it. Desolation. This is what months of attritional warfare does to a town. <laughs> Bakhmut's war hospital is a short ride from the mud and blood of the front line. 
the invasion, the casualties, the terrible cost of President Putin's attempt to subdue a people he says are the same as Russians, all of it has sharpened Ukrainians' sense of nationhood. This soldier had a lucky escape from a sniper. The bullet hit his hand. This is going to hurt, the doctor warns. The pain so far has deepened the Ukrainian will to fight. But in wars, resilience has its limits. Sustaining it needs victories, not just sacrifice. At the deadliest times, the medics work for two days straight with almost no rest. Terrible to see the pain of our soldiers, to see what kind of traumas they get in this war. The most terrible thing is to see the suffering of our country. This is the most terrible. The rest is just our job. Here I see how our boys fight. The wounds they receive ruin their lives. It depresses me more than anything else. Just behind the front line, near Bakhmut, this is a Ukrainian artillery unit's daily routine. First, reloading their missile launcher. A 50-year-old Soviet grad B-21 that is a tried and trusted killing machine. Ukraine's autumn mud has slowed down generations of armies. Mobile warfare will be easier when it freezes over. The Russians saw them coming. Incoming. Memories of peace are receding, pushed away by the debilitating routines of war. I was woken up at 4.20 a.m. February 24. Since then, I am fighting. I don't feel this counteroffensive is somehow special. It's the same as in the beginning. Of course, everyone is scared, but we overcome our fear and go fight. There was shelling. Nothing dramatic. We escaped the shelling. Our old lady helped us. We escaped. I don't feel the difference. At the other end of the front line, a long day's drive southwest from Donbass is the district of Kherson. It includes the village of Mira Lubivka, recaptured by Ukraine after days of hard fighting in September. We went there because residents said the Russians had terrorized them in six months of occupation. And because of what happened when a soldier came to this house at 11.30 on the night of the 13th of July. He dropped this bullet during the next six terrible hours, say these women. Now with her daughter in a safe place. That night, Ludmila Mimrikova, a 75-year-old great-grandmother, was alone until she says the man forced his way in and raped her. When I opened the door, he immediately punched me in the face, knocked out two of my teeth and broke my nose. I was covered with blood. He started beating me in the chest with his rifle butt. He was hitting my body and my head. I didn't understand what had I done wrong. He pulled my hair, threw me onto the sofa and began to strangle me so much that I couldn't swallow water for two weeks. Then he began to undress me and after he raped me, he cut my stomach. Until now I have scars on my stomach. The deep ones still haven't healed. Putin and the Russians will never be forgiven until the end of their world for what they did to the Ukrainians. There will be no forgiveness. As the seasons change, the war is at a critical point. Ukrainians need a victory this winter in Kherson. Russia cannot afford another defeat. That is a formula for a battle that shapes the course of the war. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, in Ukraine. In South Korea, a memorial to the victims of Saturday's Halloween crushes opened in the capital, Seoul. 
The country's president laid a single white chrysanthemum, a symbol of grief in South Korea, at the memorial altar. 154 people are reported to have died in the crush in a narrow alley in the popular Itaewon district of Seoul. Police in India have arrested nine people in connection with the collapse of a bridge in Gujarat, which resulted in the deaths of at least 140 people yesterday. They said those arrested included employees of a private company involved in the maintenance and management of the bridge. Our correspondent, Yog Tilimai, has the latest. There was barely any chance of finding survivors. But they scoured the waters for hours, hoping to at least find answers for some families. Please, sir, my sister is missing, this man told officials. A laborer, he'd brought his six-year-old sibling to the bridge on his day off. They were taking a selfie when the bridge collapsed. The terrifying moments as it happened caught on the CCTV mounted on the suspension footbridge. It destroyed families. In this home, they can barely comprehend what's hit them. Kanta Ben Muchadia has lost all her children. Three sons. <laughs> Chirag was 20. Dharmik, 18. The youngest, Chetan, 15 years old. What's left for us now? My husband and I are all alone. The people responsible for my son's deaths should be punished. Her husband Rajesh spent a painful night going from one hospital to another, searching for their children. All my sons were so good and talented. Now they are gone. I want justice for them. This is the debris of the bridge. The metal part is actually the bottom walkway of the suspension footbridge. The net there is what used to be on the sides of it. This bridge was built back in the 19th century, but it had been closed for repairs for months and only reopened about a week ago. Lots of questions being asked about whether safety checks were done before it was thrown open to the public. Nine people have been arrested, but many are asking if all those responsible will be caught. Yogita Lamay, BBC News, Morbi. Here, the COVID public inquiries asked to see Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages from his time as Prime Minister as part of its investigation into decision-making. The messages have been requested along with thousands of other documents. This part of the inquiry is focused on how decisions to impose lockdowns and restrictions were taken. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva has been voted in as Brazil's next president. It was a tight race. The former leftist leader took nearly 51% of the vote and the far-right incumbent, Jair Bolsonaro, won 49%. World leaders have welcomed the election of Lula with his commitment to restore protection of the Amazon rainforest. Our South America correspondent, Katie Watson, reports. This is a comeback like no other. 20 years since first becoming president, Lula's returning to the top job. It was celebration and tears among his supporters. Everything I achieved happened under Lula's government, Ari tells me. I went to university. My life totally changed. This has been quite the journey. A man who left power just 12 years ago with a sky-high approval rating after lifting millions out of poverty, but who then fell from grace, spending time in jail for corruption, his charges were annulled, but still, his legacy is mixed. And Lula's job to unite Brazil, almost impossible. From the 1st of January, there won't be two Brazils. We are one. We don't want to fight anymore. It's time to lay down our weapons that should never have been raised in the first place. For those who wanted Bolsonaro, devastation. Their legend, as they call him, is no longer their leader. It's a fraud. We need the army to intervene. Communism will not come here to Brazil. These are new beginnings for Brazil, but with that comes a great deal of uncertainty. Just over half of Brazil's electorate will have woken up today feeling elated. The other half are seething. 
Jair Bolsonaro is a man who stirred huge amounts of criticism, but so too has Lula. What's hard to dispute, though, is how significant this moment is for Brazil. The return of a man who President Obama once called the most popular politician on earth. Jair Bolsonaro is yet to respond. These pictures, the only proof of life since Lula's victory. His son Flavio, also a politician, acknowledged the support of fans, but everyone's waiting for the president. The silence is not a good sign. <laughs> I don't know what he and their guys are thinking. We need to give him a time to to <laughs> absorb the impact of the, the loss yesterday. With or without Bolsonaro's blessing, the hard work starts now for Lula, bringing the two sides together for reunited Brazil. Lula's victory is also a return to the world stage for Brazil, and nowhere is that more important than in the Amazon. Lula will want to deliver on his promises to end illegal deforestation, and he wants to open up collaboration rather than cutting off the conversation when it comes to climate change. Katie Watson, thanks very much. All poultry in England must be kept indoors under new restrictions to fight the country's largest ever bird flu outbreak. Five and a half million birds have died or been culled since last October. As the government announced the order, free-range turkey farmers warned there could be shortages and price rises this Christmas. So what is bird flu? It's a potentially fatal infection that spreads among birds through direct bird-to-bird -bird contact. The virus can very occasionally spread to humans, but only through touching an infected bird or droppings. The risk to the general public is extremely low, but people are advised to thoroughly cook chicken and eggs. Our environment correspondent, Jonah Fisher, reports. If you're already dreaming of Christmas dinner, listen up. It's devastating. No, it really is. Paul Kelly is a turkey farmer from Essex. Morning, boys. <laughs> In good times, he's a proud promoter of his free-range flock. It's just joyous to me to come down here in the mornings. Now, under the new housing order, farmers will have to choose whether to bring their turkeys inside or slaughter them early. You know, I've seen farms that have gone down with it. I've got close friends that have lost their businesses this Christmas, doing their Christmas poultry. Um, it gets there and, you know, once, once it's in, you know, you'll have a bit of mortality on maybe... Thursday afternoon or well, by Sunday or Monday, the entire flock will be dead. Bird flu has meant more than five million birds dying or being culled in the last year. A staggering 2.3 million of them were in October alone. One of the reasons why this outbreak is proving so hard to contain is because it's being spread from farm to farm by wild birds. All it takes is for one of them to land in a field of free-range turkey and infect them, and then the whole flock has to be destroyed. With so many wild birds carrying the disease, many farmers are now calling for a change in strategy that accepts that bird flu is here to stay. Is it time for us to move away from culling birds to vaccinating birds? Well, there's a huge amount of work and now global discussion going on on what effective vaccination and effective surveillance will look like. Certainly at this time last year that conversation wasn't happening, now it is, which is a really good step. So what does it mean for those making plans for Christmas dinner? Free-range turkeys may be more expensive, but it really depends on, on where you are in the country and the uh, producer that you're buying from. Bird flu cases have been reported in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but for now this housing order only applies to England. At poultry farms across the UK, strict biosecurity measures remain in place. Jonah Fisher, BBC News. The current warm autumn temperatures may be lovely for some, and it certainly looks glorious, but they're confusing nature and jeopardising fragile ecosystems, according to wildlife experts. As temperatures remain well above average for this time of year, Britain's rare chalk grasslands and wildlife such as hedgehogs and dormice are among those under threat, with some summer plants continuing to flower into the autumn. Duncan Kennedy reports from East Sussex. It may look like autumn is in full flow, but when you see Berberis darwini or Gunnera tinctoria, 
or even rhododendrons in full bloom, well then you know something is not quite right. A lovely beautiful flower out on it on the moment but we we wouldn't normally expect to see that until, until um, May next year. Chris Skinner, a horticulturalist for 15 years, says the recent mild weather is confusing the plant world. Why does it matter that all these flowers and all this change is going on right now? Uh, it matters because it means that the, the plants are wasting a lot of their valuable energy. Uh, the spring flowering plants are flowering at the wrong time of year, so that wastes their potential for next year. Um, and it also means that some of our trees are really confused. But it's not just plants and trees being thrown off by this topsy-turvy autumnal weather. Wildlife, too, is also being confused. Well, this one we would expect to be hibernating um, sort of this November, December time. Hedgehogs are just one species being fooled by the climate. We've got um, birds that are not nesting because it's either too hot or too cold. We've got hedgehogs that are not hibernating because it's too warm when it's supposed to be nice and cold. Um, and of course, it's having a big impact on our baseline food chain with insects not being there as part of the food source. So it's having a major impact. When autumn is squashed by summer, wildlife and plants get squeezed too. Fragile ecosystems being caught out by the changing climate. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News. Well, it feels like the right time to look at the weather. Matt is here. So, Matt, is there... I mean, it has been fantastically warm in many parts of the country. Is there any sign that this is going to come to an end? Signs that will return much closer to normal later this week, Fiona. But it has been not just a remarkable month, a remarkable year so far. Let me just show you this chart. It's the Central England Temperature Series. It's the oldest instrumental temperature series in the world. The green bars here just show how the temperature usually varies throughout the year. This is the average. Let me put on what's happened so far this year. Every single month so far has been warmer than normal. You can see by the uh, size of some of those orange bars by some considerable degree as well. But as we just mentioned to Fiona, there will be some changes this week. Just so Some, some heavy rain around across many areas too. There could be some big puddles around, a little bit of minor flooding into the morning. Certainly not going to be a cold morning though. Temperatures again for many in double figures. Now there'll be some wet weather first thing. Scotland across northeast England in particular. Sunshine and showers mix elsewhere. But through the day, southern Scotland, northern England, northern Ireland, probably some of the driest conditions. Whereas Wales, the Midlands, southern England, this is where showers will develop more widely, become heavy and thundery. And it's across the south where the winds will be strongest again. Temperatures down a little bit on today's values, but still warmer than you want for the first day of November. Now, things will turn a little bit quieter through the night and then into Wednesday, but Wednesday brings this developing low-pressure system. Heavy rain to go with it across western areas initially, pushing its way east. was never quite reaching some parts of eastern England till very late in the day, but the big story for many is the strength of the wind. Widespread gales, potentially disruptive gusts of wind across the west, and then as we go into Wednesday night, it's going to be across parts of Scotland, be buffeted by those potentially disruptive winds. Easing through Thursday, rain lingers in the south, but for the end of the week, Fiona, it is is looking cooler. Matt, thanks very much. And that is the BBC News at 10 on the 31st of October. There's more analysis of the day's main stories on Newsnight with Kirsty Walk, which is just getting underway over on BBC Two. There she is. And the news continues here on BBC One as now it's time to join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are. From the 10 team, good night. Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With me are Harriet Lyne, who's chief political correspondent at the Daily Mail, and the broadcaster and psychotherapist Lucy Beresford. Well, let's take a look first at tomorrow's front pages. And the Metro leads with searing criticism of the Manston Processing Centre for Asylum Seekers from a report by Her Majesty's, His Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons. The Eye has the Home Secretary fighting for her political survival, with Cabinet Ministers questioning whether she's up to the job. 
The Guardian says that Suella Braverman is ramping up the rhetoric on asylum seekers and denying that she's to blame for the crisis at the Manston Refugee Centre. The Mail, meanwhile, highlights the Home Secretary's claims that the asylum system is broken and that illegal migration is out of control. Large tax rises and spending cuts ahead. That's the warning in The Telegraph, which says Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt have agreed a plan to fill the government's 50 billion fiscal black hole. While the Financial Times carries news of the troubled UK battery manufacturer, British Vault, apparently on the brink of collapse. OK, well, so much to discuss, um, uh, Harriet and Lucy. Let's start with the Metro, which has got a very um, arresting and disturbing picture, of course. Children um, behind uh, a, a sort of mesh fence. Uh, welcome to the UK. Migrants camp hell exposed. Um, Harriet, I wonder if I could get you to start, because the papers really are full of Suella Braverman and the uh, difficulties that she's finding herself in, in terms of both policy and her own uh, political situation. But if we could start with the policy first, start with Manston. Um, she, was, she, she came to the House of Commons today uh, to talk about the situation. Where do you think she stands? Yeah, so she came to the Commons uh, this afternoon uh, to discuss the...